Pep Love. Yes. Yeah. Pop them quick as you What? The mic's on you. After dark. Yeah. After dark, it's ripping season. After dark, it might happen for the wrong reasons. After dark, and it don't cease until the break of dawn. I shoot the breeze. After dark, it's ripping season. After dark, it might happen for the wrong reasons. After dark, and it don't cease until the break, break of dawn. I shoot the breeze. That's how we rock the mic. I'm on Olympics in period. Non stop. After dark, the sun ain't shining. Pet love. Mind power. The next level. Nighttime. After dark, I shoot the breeze. After dark, it's ripping season. After dark, it might happen for the wrong reasons. After dark, and it don't cease into the Whatever you need to do. All right, we're going to move on to our next feature. Uh, Andrea Daniel is a lifelong poet with work in publications and as a part of a visual poetry exhibit at the Detroit Institute of Arts. When she's not writing poetry, Andrea is a freelance writer for various publications. She is also freelanced for an internationally distri distributed arts and entertainment magazine. Andrea is co-owner and operator of Dakota Avenue West Publishing and copywriter, editor, and voiceover artist with their own small business and communications. That's how it's written on, I swear. All that, the whole thing. She is a member of the Motown Writers, I'm sorry, wait a minute, I got lost. Motown Writers Network and the Michigan Literary Network and is a producer of the Michigan Literary Network's internet radio show on blogtalkradio.com. Additionally, as if we haven't had a, yes, this is awesome. This is a real bio for you. Additionally, she is a registered songwriter with BMI. She lives in Detroit, Michigan with her son and a sweet little terrier poodle. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't pre-read this right. A sweet little terrier poodle mix named Dot. Please welcome Andrea Daniel. Come on up. It's funny when you hear somebody read about yourself, like, dang, stop talking about all that. Just, I hate my bio. Anyway, thank you, thank you, thank you for allowing me to be here. I love Tracy Curry. She's my girl. Thank you so much. Give her another hand. Uh, as my bio said, I am a lifelong poet. I'm an older lady. Thank you very much. And uh, I have just published my first book. Um, it came out in October, and it is called Like Gwendolyn, and it's in honor of the poet Gwendolyn Brooks. Anybody heard of the poet Gwendolyn Brooks? Yes, yes, yes I love it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A lot of people are like, who's she? I don't know Gwendolyn Brooks, but she was, a, she was a wonderful poet way back in the day. And she was one of the first African-American poets and women that I was introduced to as a little girl. And she impacted me so much, I was like, well, I want to be a poet like her. And I had the opportunity to meet her two times in my life. Um, she died back in the 80s, but um, she was a wonderful poet. That's why I named my book Like Gwendolyn. And the cover of the, poet, the, cover of the book is actually me when I was 10. And uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, she's kind of fuzzed out, but uh, it was me and Gwendolyn Brooks at the Detroit Main Library back in 1972. So uh, women about women, I'm a woman, thank you very much. And <laughs> I've got a lot of poems in here about women because I'm a woman. And we go through a lot of experiences and we have a lot of emotions. So we're gonna go through all this. So just to put some things out there, let me see all my moms, moms out in the audience, wonderful. We have any wives out in the audience? Woo! Wives, wives, good. We have any single women out in the audience? Good, good. We have any best friends who are out in the audience? Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna have a little bit of all of that. A little bit of all of that. Um, first one is brown-eyed Susan in the rose garden. A brown-eyed Susan in a garden of roses looks like a brown-eyed Susan in a garden of roses. And what she's supposed to do amongst all those roses? Either she wants to be a rose, wither away, or find some other brown-eyed Susans. Or, the roses could delight in the warmth of difference she brings and love her for her brownness. That's that one. Some things that we experience as women are not very pretty, okay? 
And sometimes we meet men who don't treat us or say things who are so, that are so nice, right? So this is in honor of that. It's called friendly, but not too. <laughs> A curse from mama. This beauty that drives men crazy and women to envy with pains like labor. So when she met him, she was friendly, but not too. She had met his kind before. He couldn't get her out of his head. Whenever she stepped into the lobby, he was on her with hellos and beautifuls and how you doing today? Like he had never seen a pretty woman before. And she was friendly, but not too. Then he was in her space, too close, came to her office for no real reason, stalking her like she was in heat. Finally, she resorted to it would be better if you just stopped talking to me. <laughs> then he was on her with, bitch. That's that. <laughs> and it happens. We don't like it, but, you know, so we have to guard ourselves. So we say, just don't talk to me. And then they come at us like that, and we just go, see ya. Um, I had the, uh, in, in my lifetime, I have had the opportunity to meet some really, really wonderful people. Anybody heard of this, the poet Sonia Sanchez? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. I had the opportunity to do a, an hour-long interview with Sonia Sanchez. Blew my mind. Just sent me away. So this is after the talk for Sonia Sanchez. She became my priestess, my guru, my petite goddess. From then on, I wanted to sit beside her and breathe her air, study her. From then on, it was Sonia said this and Sonia said that. And when I talked to Sonia, she said thus and so, thus and so. And poetry became fresh, where the atmosphere had been dull, lifeless, stale. Sonia exhaled what I needed and I wanted it in my lungs. Her books became Bibles. Her wisdom was like Solomon on earth, and I wanted it in my lungs. In my lungs. That's that one. Okay, so along with the things that aren't so pretty, there are some things that are really nice, and sometimes somebody in life makes you feel really special. So at another time in my life, I had the opportunity to be in the presence of um, Alex Haley, you know, the man who wrote Roots. Spent a nice long time with him when I was at Oakland University many, many years ago. And Alex Haley had a very deep, rich voice, and I have a thing for voices. And so being in the presence of him made me write this poem when Mr. Haley said my name. Never before have I heard my name like song until you spoke it. Was the most enchanting lyric ever released to the air. No longer the name my mother gave dipped in your resonance. It took on an aura intimate as birth. At the sound of my name in your voice, I felt like stardust on a pedestal for display. And I wanted to capture it in stained glass and hold on to it because you were only around for one day, it seemed, just to say my name and make it more beautiful than anyone ever had. Um, this poem was inspired by a picture I saw in um, depicting the, the Million Man March. And it was a picture of uh, a dark man, dark black man, with welts on his back. And, you know, there were images of men all around the foot of it. And so some, for some reason, it conjured up this particular poem called One in a Million. With whipcord wounds, beaded, bloody, and stuck to his shirt, he hugged his wife. The baby wanted to ride on his back and did. She knew nothing of his pain, only that daddy was home and she loved him. It takes passion to withstand a beating and just as much passion to cleanse the wounds. So each time he came home with the beating on his back, his wife wiped away the blood, singing love songs into his ear. Their tears mingled underfoot, and at most, there was love. Thank you. 
you. Um, this poem is Blue Beauty. I like to watch men watching women. <laughs> and I like to see their reaction if they should get some kind of response from the woman. So I like to see that. And this is also an ode to the dark woman. Raise your hands if you're a dark woman. Okay. That's right. Thank you. Skin glistens like glazed ebony, so black and blue, so, so dark and smooth, so black, she's blue. A glance captures you where you stand, a smile and creation reborn. She speaks and sunrise climbs your soul, a touch and you forget your name. Um, I'm going to try this. I've never done this one like this before. I don't know if I've ever done this one at all in public. Any old way, um, anybody know the song, the old classic song called Nature Boy? Okay, well, I'm going to try it anyway. You might like it. I don't know. There was a boy, a certain strange enchanted boy. They say he traveled very far, very far over land and sea. A little shy and sad of eye, but very wise was he. And then one day, one magic day he came my way and there we spoke of many things fools and kings and this he said to me the greatest joy you will ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. He sees her crystal clear like lace, speaks in hyperboles that go totally beyond her, but she's slipping anyway. He tells her she is an epic, an ode, a simple poem that makes him cry. And it's all beyond her, but she's slipping anyway. Because he knows how she feels about herself and loves her in spite of her doubts. The greatest joy you will ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. Um, thank you. I know, that was that one. Sorry. I forgot to let you know that it was done. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, this is a poem in honor of being single. I am single and have been single for a really long time. I got married in 1988, left him in 1992, divorced him in 1995 and have been pretty much single all along. And I'm pretty good with being single, I like it. I have a really good circle of friends and you know, I'm really fine with it. And I don't usually sing what I call the single woman's lament, oh, I don't have nobody to love me because I have a really good life. But on this particular day when I wrote this poem, I guess I was kind of tired of being single. <laughs> so this is called Plea. Funny how love finds some and eludes others. How do you get on the to be loved list? Is there a lottery, an election? Can I write in my name? Must I sit cross-legged in a field of cotton during the first spring rain? Must I kill a chicken, scrape its claws across the soil, sacrifice its blood to the dead? Must I dance naked through a cemetery, run naked nine times around the block on the night of the full moon on the first day of my blood flow? <laughs> Must I call on God, Allah, the Orishas, or Buddha? Must I be a better me? grow my hair, lose weight, gain weight, wear new clothes. Must I write love poems and burn them in your front yard? Oh, keeper of love selection. <laughs> what must I do to be found? Surely something more than wait. 
Ya está. I like y'all. Y'all laugh and stuff. That's really good. I like this. This is good. Um, you know when you're just getting into a relationship or you just met somebody and you're trying it on for size, you know, just trying to see if, it, if you like them, if you like each other, and sometimes you want to call, and you're like, oh, well, I don't know, I don't want to interrupt him, I don't want to interrupt her. So this one, this poem is in honor of that. It's called Welcomed Interruption. I want him to interrupt the silence in my life with his breathing. With the in and out sound of air flowing through his lungs, the rising and falling of his chest as that air passes from his body to mine. I, I want the interruption of his call, unexpected, at noon, not saying much, but there, forging through the unsaid, testing the unknown. The interruption of his hesitant request to spend time, to linger longer than the rule book says, to listen as he pieces his, his life together in fragments as I unveil mine. I want the interruption of him making me feel wanted. That's all. It's just kind of nice to feel wanted sometimes. It's just okay. Um, this is a little shorty, and I'm almost done. I got two more to go. This, this one is called Outfitted. Huh? <laughs> just two more, just two more. Um, outfitted. Last night, I tried on the moonlight just to see how it would fit. You wrapped it around my shoulders and gave me a star for a brooch. We both agreed. It's the best outfit I've ever worn. Um, here's another part about life that's not too pretty. Part of my story is I am a 20-year survivor of domestic violence, and thank you. Um, that's the one, that was from the one that I left back in 1992. I left it. Um, and during the time when I left, there were many years going through recovery, and I wrote a whole bunch of poems during my time of recovery. And one of them is this one, and it's called No Private Healing. There will be no private healing for me. I will not keep this pain to myself, will not hoard the memory of the batterings, will not conceal my colored over bruises. My mouth will speak of this at every opportunity, and I will be heard. You. Someone, anyone needs to know that I suffered and cried, feared for my life, my sanity, and my son. That I was locked inside a shell I didn't know any better not to want. That I accepted who hit me with a weak smile, tainted, beaten, and confused love. My past could not have been what it was, but it was because I will not forget. And I will not keep quiet. There will be no quiet healing for me. And um, let's see, this one is uh, written as a mother. I have a 21-year-old son, love him to death. When he was a little boy, starting from the age of two, um, after I had left his dad and took him, my son, with me, a judge ordered that my son had to um, go back and visit his father. His father lived in Maryland. So my son would leave me at the age of two, starting at the age of two, uh, for very long periods of time. And so during those times when he was gone, I wrote pretty much what I, you know, call like love letters to my son, about my son. And this is one of them, and it's called um, No Other Love. The kind that wakes you first thing in the morning and cries for you at night, whose company you crave when you're at work and miss when he's asleep. The kind that meets you at the door with leaps and bounds and smiles all over and laughs with you when the rain falls or the sun shines, shares your all when the sky is blue or gray or pink, the kind who sits on your lap and rests his head on your shoulder, who eats what you don't and drinks what you want, whose questions come from everywhere, whose observations are fresh and pure, he sees things that are not as if they are. The kind whose hand slips into yours, stares you straight in the eye, knows something's wrong just by the look on your face, whose mind you love for what it is, whose heart you feel for what it brings. Nothing compares to his kind of love. Thank you. And 
I've got books for sale. If you liked anything you heard me say, you can take it home with you. And my books are only $10. Only $10. That's right. The next level, nighttime. After dark, I shoot the breeze. After dark, it's ripping season. After dark, it might happen for the wrong reasons. After dark, and it don't cease into the break. My name is Paul Heron Jr. and my dad said he'd pay me a quarter for every person I got to come down and join the village, whatever that means. So I figured I'd just come on TV, smile real nice, and ask you guys to come down and join the village. So if a thousand of you guys come down and tell my dad you saw this commercial, I'll be set. Then again, we might as well make that 6,000, because my friends want in too. Juneteenth, African American Independence Day, a time to reflect and rejoice. June 16th through the 19th in downtown Flint. From noon to 9.30, every day. <laughs> Vending opportunities. Oh yeah, there's still time to sign up. Contact us at 810-239-2901. That's 810-239-2901. Juneteenth! African American Independence Day. Join the village. Did I say 25 cents? Oh man, how you gonna play me like that? You gotta see this. See this frog? I add boiling water. No, wait, 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 wait. See that? He jumps out. Smart frog. Now this guy, he's just as smart, but he won't jump out. Could jump out, but he won't. Really? He'll just stay in the beaker as the temperature slowly rises, never noticing, until he boils alive. Why doesn't he just get out? I mean, if he can get out, he should just get out. Right? Hello, my name is Ed Bullard from the Flint, Genesee Hate Crime Response Task Force. In Michigan, hate crimes are defined as a criminal offense committed against a person or property which is motivated in whole or in part by the offender's bias against a race, national origin, religion, sexual orientation, mental or physical disability, or ethnicity. Federal and some local laws include gender identity. Cross burning, white hoods, swastikas, and slurs may be hate crime indicators. All human beings are born free with equal dignity and rights. All blood runs red. Let's stop hate crimes. For more information, contact the Michigan Alliance Against Hate Crimes. Hi, this is Jim Scroviero. We're here at Skid Marks Raceway. We're here racing our slot cars. It's made in Flint, and we're proud of it. How do you make an apple more user friendly? How do you make an apple more user friendly? How do you make an apple more user friendly? You 
Those are more apple friendly. The Flint Apple Club. 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 Underneath everything we are, we are all people. And when we reach out a hand to one, we can influence the condition of all. That's what it means to live united. Only on public access. <laughs> That's right. And I am done. And thank you very, very much. All right. That's Miss Andrea Daniel. I I'm, I'm definitely need to pick up some books today. I like that. I heard a lot of things I liked in there. How about you guys? Yeah. Yes, yes. Pretty funny, there's a lot of topics going on. I, I like that, I like that. We had a lot of diversity going on today, so um, thanks to everybody who showed up to support and also to, especially to the features, so, and the open mic list folk. And I'm gonna move on to my, oh wait, I got an announcement. She's in the back. So, for the Flint 500 series, you guys can purchase the tickets, like I said, and the wristbands, which I got mine. You should get yours. And they told me they take cash or debit cards. <laughs> they take cash or debit. Like, this is technology. I don't know. I don't have that phone, but whatever. $10. $10. Dr. Curry's trying to get somebody's attention right over here. The feature that we just went. Somebody wants a book. Boom, book sale. Get it going. Let's give it up for her while she goes sell the book. Woo! Dawn, did I see her? Yeah. Okay, boom. Awesome. Awesome. Final performer. T. Miller. T. Miller is currently ranked as the number five female slam poet in the world. The whole world. The whole thing. Yes, the world. That's what it says. She now produces the popular It's Not About You poetry slam series. Recently, she started her own publishing company, All I Want to Say Publishing. In 2010, she published her first book of quotes, Dreams of a Beginner. And in 2011, she published her second book, Coming Out of Nowhere, a social networking memoir that allows readers to mentally and emotionally log in to their favorite websites, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, <laughs> and view the opinions of others on love, hate, suicide, tragedy, politics, religion, cyberbullying, entertainment, mental illness, freedom of choice, homophobia, and other things that surround homosexuality by simply turning a page. She's currently working on, sorry, currently working with popular video director Erica D. Hayes on a documentary that focuses on prostitution and placement in the transgendered community. Natasha uses her words to enlighten, create equality, and most importantly, spread love and peace in the tradition of great leaders before her, please give it up for T. Miller. How y'all feeling? Everybody on this side of the room must be dead. How y'all feeling? Y'all alive over here? Hey. I know it's hot, but damn. All right, um, so I like to, well, first of all, I'm gonna be honest. Um, I'm no longer the number five female slam poet in the world. And I was last year, but uh, the Women of the World Poetry Slam just passed like last week and I didn't go out this year. So um, I, got, I didn't lose the title, which just, it just doesn't belong to me anymore. Um, <laughs> so I didn't go. Uh, all right, so, I um, mean, yeah, I was number three for two years and uh, whatever. It's not number one, so it doesn't matter. Um, all right, so. <laughs> Be real honest with myself. Uh, all right, so I like to start off all of my features doing this thing called 10 Things That I Learned Over the Decade. 
So I kind of swap out what, you know, as I learn things and I kind of keep the things that I feel like people need to continue to learn. And uh, it's really short, because I don't like to just jump into poems because I'm nervous as hell all the time. So I'm gonna do this for y'all. One, math has always been a hard subject. So it should be no surprise that most of the people we tend to count on fail us too. My love was a perfect sentence and my ex was a typo that ruined it. Three, <laughs> three, my mother's an author. I'm the best book ever written and most of the people I've been in relationships with just can't read. Four, <laughs> so many excuses for love. Four, <laughs> the interesting thing about liars is that they always know the truth. Five, <laughs> Facebook and Twitter are priorities. But judging by most of the statuses I read, spelling correctly has always been an option. Six, <laughs> six, poets who can't write tend to develop mouths like plungers and start to speak other people's shit. Seven, wow. um, Poets who can't write tend to develop mouths like plungers and start to speak other people's shit. Seven, seven, wash your face and your ass with two different towels. Um, <laughs> I had to learn it. Um, <laughs> eight, God kicked Lucifer out of heaven because God knows that keeping your enemies closer is just stupid. Nine, <laughs> nine, <laughs> I moved my mouth next door to me lately. I've been living by my own words. 10, wow. 10, Barack Obama is indeed the new black. And that's all it took for Disney to give our little girls a princess. Thank you. Wow. So that's the first All right, so yeah, if you, you guys are great, but if you like want to snap and clap and throw shit at the stage when I'm performing, feel free to do it. Don't hit me with it because I don't have health insurance, so like just throw shit over here. Like I fall over easily, so please don't don't hit me. Uh, but yeah, you know, yeah, feel free to you know make noises even if you don't like what I'm saying. You can still make noises to pretend like you do because it just gets real awkward when shit gets quiet up here. So um, um <laughs> so I don't want to depress y'all. Don't you love when people say that and they about to depress y'all with a depressing poem? Like, I really don't want to, but I'm going to do it anyway because I really want to. So here goes. Uh, it's a poem uh, about my best friend in my life. Her grandmother died recently, and this, this is my poem dedicated to that. My best friend told me that her grandmother was dying. And I told her that I would pray for her, but I forgot to pray that night which woke me up questioning if half the people that say they pray for me even pray at all. I wonder if they just fall asleep on my needs, pretend that some blessings that they never asked for are coming for me, and still tell me with Bibles on their tongues and scriptures in their eyes that I'm praying for you. You see, I'm starting to believe that the only thing ever meant to be falling from the sky is me. I've tasted the pavement so many times that my first child might come out mixed with cement. I was born with a boulder in my throat, gravel in my lungs, was forced to learn how to talk tough early. So don't tell me that I don't know what a hard life is and to make matters worse. My imaginary friend died when I was 12. I guess God was tired of playing with me. So much for putting your faith in people you've never seen. I heard my uncle planned his funeral, so I spent my last $3 on a thank you card for him, making sure my friend made it to heaven. But now I know it was just to make sure he was really gone. So on Judgment Day, his obsession with girls 30 years younger would go unnoticed. I want my fucking money back. My mother says, baby, God is watching over all of us. But I know that there's no kickstand in his eyelids. And I've witnessed the sky fall asleep on too many occasions to believe that he's always up and yes my walk is broken like I've thrown too many stones in my past life there's glass in my spine dead roses in my knees this type of shit you just don't grow out of with a past in my brain like leukemia I said this type of shit you just don't grow out of I'm a 27 year old fifth grader look at me 
I throw temper tantrums on poetry stages. I still avoid spending summer vacations at my aunt's and at night when everyone in my house is sleeping. I search for my imaginary friend and I know that that shit might sound crazy, but when you develop padded walls inside your head just to keep your thoughts from getting out, what do you expect? It rains and I question. That's my imaginary friend somewhere pissing on my head or trying to water the dead roses in my legs. I know that he misses me, so I live like there's a clock in my vagina and a watch in every kiss. I make love to time, and if you ever came inside of me, we probably have to name our baby something like right now or forever or in the moment. And a few months ago, I turned 27 in the middle of reciting this poem. And it meant more to me than anybody in that room could have ever known. It meant that somebody, somewhere, were really sending up my prayers. And if you happen to be sitting in one of these chairs tonight, I just want to say thank you. Because sometimes, sometimes life feels like a game that came with two controllers. It just wasn't meant to be played alone. Sometimes you just need the extra hands. And I know that we all put erasers inside of our mouths from time to time and forget to do the things we said we'd do. But if you ever happen to wake up and there's a dent in your pillow or your palms feel just a little bit heavier than usual, you forgot about somebody last night. But it's okay, because I taught my imaginary friend the importance of getting up with the sun. Thank you. So I got a poem, a new poem that I'm working on in. It's actually dedicated to Detroit, and I'm sure you guys are feeling the same pain in, in Flint. On Monday morning, a teacher comes in, sits down, and checks her cell phone before checking attendance. I guess how many followers she's lost on Twitter is much more important than how many students she's lost over the weekend. See this, this is a place where the little boys have more heat on their waist than they have heat in their classrooms and the rows and schools are all on their way to becoming aisles and shopping centers because building Walmarts and creating killers and cashiers is obviously much more important than saving schools and graduating kids. See Detroit is not a city, it's a frustrated karma with a thing for kids, a reason for some to believe that God may be a bit of a pedophile or a victim of all timers. See this, this is why we found no time to worry about your Wall Street, their 1% and the black cars because the kids in my city are zero, no higher, trying to find a box other than a casket to think outside of and occupying graveyards. We've got a church on every corner and still got a better chance of being found in trunks than being found by Christ. I said Detroit is not a city. It's a chessboard played by a neglected son and a recovering addict for a father turning people with potentials into pawns and prisoners just to say that they spent time together. It's an upside down foxhole filled with crabs and if you live here, you never have to worry about Jesus coming back to get you because Detroit is an inner city school that God would never send his child to. All right, so this is a piece I wrote. Do you guys know who Amber Rose is? Yes. Okay. Have you seen Amber Rose pictures? No. Okay, he touched his girl. No, I haven't seen him. He lying. <laughs> oh, all right, so, all right, so what happened? <laughs> Not of your phone? Okay. So uh, Amber Rose is Kanye West's ex-girlfriend. I actually did a show, like, with a lot of people in the audience, and somebody was like, let me see the picture. And I'm not saying I had it in my phone. I'm just saying I had a phone that was on me that the pictures were in, and I, like, you know, <laughs> somebody else's phone. And everybody, like, this picture before this phone, but it was very interesting. So Amber Rose took some naked pictures. She was at home, you know, doing whatever you do when you're at home, maybe masturbating, maybe not. I mean, I'm not saying I do it. I'm not saying that y'all do it. I'm saying she was. So, um, <laughs> so somebody leaked the pictures of her you know, doing her thing. And then she started getting dropped from some of her uh, modeling sponsors and she came out and she apologized for, you know, taking the pictures at home in the privacy, you know, of her own home. And I wrote this piece to her because of that apology. It's something strangely awkward about discussing masturbation while eating sushi. I mean, <laughs> It's damn, it's damn near impossible to convince a person to touch something raw, eat something raw, all within the same conversation. Earlier in the week, she was caught in a hotel room with three high school boys. 
It's my turn to have the talk, and I treat her as something new, and I go easy on her because I already know half of her problem. She has skin as muddy as water. She has a severe case of the brown girl blues and is willing to turn into a harmonica for any boy with enough breath to blow away her darkness. This is my cousin. She's 12. She thinks light-skinned girls are gulfs and black girls are just their oil spills. Her only talent is pretending to be a preteen sky. She's responsible for raising all of her mother's sons. And I know that this makes her believe that women were born to be winter doormats, a place where men wipe their shoes and leave snow and leave cold and leave little girls with nothing more than speed bumps to look forward to. Amber Rose, I'm almost willing to bet that the day after your apology for taking a picture with your fingers in your vagina, that little girls everywhere, like my cousin, immediately started to curse their hands and search for more dicks and birth control pills to feel whole. But then again, who are you to teach our kids that touching themselves is safer? Why turn your pussy into a PSA when you can just be labeled the reason Wiz Khalifa can't stop smoking and continue to be the blonde dyke that Kanye West calls a bitch every chance that he gets to your sponsors didn't want you to know that those pictures were inappropriate. They wanted you to never forget that a pretty bitch in a house is still just an ugly nigga from the field. Don't get too comfortable on our couches. Don't bring your children or your pride in our home. Amber Rose, you could have been the bridge between Nelly being able to get a tip drill and Erica Badu not being dressed enough for a fucking window seat next to her own independence. You should have tweeted, I was more than horny. I was human. I was helping somebody's little cousin to understand that light-skinned girls still need themselves and it is okay to be woman and be black and be dangerous enough to feel sexy about it, but instead, you turned your statement into a sorry. Once again proved that Eve was nothing more than the rib of a man and an image closely resembling Kim Kardashian or Marilyn Monroe. See, what you should have done was again prepped your pussy for the camera and asked, where the fuck is my TV show? <laughs> Cheat sheet here, y'all still with me? Uh, uh, uh. Alright, so if you like anything that I'm saying, I do have CDs for sale, I do have books for sale. Together, they're $20. Um, $20. dollars Yep, uh, I take credit cards and all that good shit, so checks. So y'all ain't gotta go to the ATM, we good right here. Um, I only got a few books too, I just like came from Hawaii for like a whole month and uh, so I kind of sold out of all my shit. Um, so I just bought the few that I had, so I hope you guys get to purchase that afterwards. Um, all right, so what do I want to talk about? All right, I got, a, I got a piece. This piece is dedicated to the documentary that I'm working on uh, called The Women on Woodward, and it's about prostitution in the transgender community. And it's dedicated to a teen that lost her life in Detroit a few months ago. And it's to anybody struggling with coming out or, or being out. The first thing that you should do is not tell your parents that you are gay. Tell your mom and dad some shit like you're a graffiti artist at heart, you have spray paint for emotions, and then you just sit and hope that your home is not listed as abandoned because of the illegal colors that their tagger has left on the window. Second thing, if you are out, always wear a watch because when the unexpected hit from a pipe cracks up your skull like the punchline of a bad Tracy Morgan joke, you look down at your wrist, know exactly what time it was when God treated your sexuality like a joke that his bloody sense of humor has been waiting years to laugh at when your father's fists turn into space shuttle, when your face becomes his moon, leaving your eyes all dark and crater-like. You get up the next day, wear the word faggot like an expensive pair of sunglasses, carry Sakia's gun in your mouth, you shoot back at every homophobe that tries to ruin you with their words. Bring a fruitcake to every Christmas party that you'll never be welcomed at. Tell the kid curious about your gender that you are not a boy or a girl. You were born a hate crime, an ant under a magnifying glass, a reason to be burned by the son and the son of God and the son of any family member who believes that Westboro Church should stand outside of soldiers' funerals picketing and pissing outdated Bible verses on their bravery. Remember that your 
status will always be two Facebook comments away from family members raising money to bury you, an identity change and a cab ride away from your fiery torso being found on the east side of Detroit. You'll be thrown off of airplanes for being in love, out of church for being in touch, banned from sports for being open, raped by your military to seem more American. They will cross streets to not share a sidewalk with you. Die of thirst before drinking from a water fountain that you've used, throw cocktails through your colors, and D.O. Hughley will still say that this shit ain't no civil rights movement. Dying over taking dick and picking cotton, well, they're just not the same. This world cares nothing about how many clocks we own. There will never be a right time for us to be ourselves. And when you leave home, make sure your picture is just how you want to be remembered just in case you return as someone else or not at all. Lastly, when the footsteps behind you start to get closer and the ground starts to sound like a gun range, you open up your arms like your back is a bullseye and a god is the target. Think back to that one conversation you had with your parents about being a graffiti artist, and you prepare for your emotions to be paint. Um, all right, so I'm going to do these last two pieces, and I'm going to get out of y'all way. If you tweet, I'm T. Miller Poetry on Twitter, Facebook, Natasha T. Miller. Make sure y'all go check out the Flint 500 Slam. That shit is fucking awesome, so don't miss it. Um, all right, so I said I was not going to do this piece. I'm like, I'm so tired of this piece, but it's Women's History Month, and then Omari was like, no, you can't ever, ever stop doing this piece. So, you know, he's bigger than me, so I was like, okay, good. Um, I'm going to never, ever stop doing this piece, at least when you're around. So, um, all right, so this piece was originally dedicated to my grandmother, and since it is Women's History Month, I'm going to uh, do the piece in honor of that, and it's called Us Black Women. Us Black Women like samples at a grocery store set out to be picked over and never fully paid for us, black women, with vaginas that still smell like unwanted mixed babies, blood, and 400 years of forced entries. And this nigga asks you, can he hit it? as if it hasn't already been beaten. Outcast goes to court with Rosa Parks, Ludacris makes a diss record about Oprah, and a room full of upstanding black men say, we don't know what happened in that car. Rihanna may have given Chris Brown a reason to beat her down. I take it, I take it you don't have little sisters, and there must be shrapnel in your back to replace the spine that once made you a man. See, I'm not mad at you for your opinion. I'm just hoping that we are never two pop stars alone in a car, and you get mad at me for mine. I can still hear the cries of all the babies that had to get left behind by their own mothers. I've got the tongue of Harriet Tubman, can still taste the blood of all the wounds she licked to get us here, and we are constantly trying to get back there. And you say, she don't like her own people because she built a school in Africa. You must have forgotten your roots. Do you think that we only exist here? I've never seen you leave a penny in a gas station. You couldn't imagine the pain of raising a black panther only to hear your son calling you bitches and hoes on the radio. You are no Athena Shakur. Your jaw couldn't walk a Miles Davis inside the mouth of Cicely Tyson. And you question the charity of a black woman while this man asks, can he hit it as if it hasn't already been beaten? We have been running this world since it started, have yet to receive a day off of our feet. There are no holidays dedicated to us. Just a bunch of poems used to undress everything but our minds. Music of songs played to make us feel like we were born to be called everything but our names. And cemeteries dressed up like videos, burying our images every other TV station. We get one Michelle every 44 years. We get one African-American teen pregnancy every 44 minutes. And Lil Wayne says he wants to fuck every girl in the world. Sarah Good and Vince Bedge, Trey Song said, we don't think he invented sex, how disconnected we are, yet hanging from the same umbilical cords we clipped you from. Nigga, stop asking, can you hit it? Take your mother flowers for no reason. Stop making excuses for you putting your hands on us. Stop putting your hands on us. Stop running out on us. Stop running over us. Stop treating us like samples at a grocery store. Do not touch us if you have no plans on making this home. All right, so uh, this, is, this is a fun piece I'm going to end out on, so no more depressing shit. Uh, all right. <laughs> well, okay, he's good? He's good? Okay. All right, okay. That seems like that's your job. You just kind of sit in the front row like, no, no, you good. You, you straight. You straight. You straight. No, I swear. <laughs> like, you good? That's him. Like, no, I'm saying keep going. Like, all right, fuck it. Uh, all right, so... <laughs> 
So this is a fun piece. Um, so this is like a true story. Like I was dating this person. We were dating for like three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine or ten months, something like that, right? And because um, <laughs> I figured like after three months, it's just really long. Like three months, three years, I don't know the difference. So uh, once you say I love you, it's really over. It's like we we married now. So um, <laughs> so we we were on the phone and uh, this person was like, "Do you gonna be my girlfriend?" I said no. They hung up on me. I never heard from them again. But since I'm a poet, I decided shit wasn't going to end there, right? I'm like, well, I also didn't have any other like options. Like I was on Facebook and I got unfriended, Gchat, I got blocked, you know, all shit like that. So I had to take it to the poetry. Uh, so if y'all happen to see this person, tell them they got a poem. Um, and since it's Women's History Month, this is the difference between a girlfriend and a woman for those of you who don't know yet. Um, a girlfriend will give you butterflies. A woman will give you eagles with wings strong enough to cause a hurricane in your lungs every time you take a breath in her presence. A girlfriend will make you smile. A woman will make your tongue feel like a seven-year-old little girl and your lips split like the ropes that are about to help her double dutch her way into popularity. A girlfriend will come over to your house and help clean up your kitchen. A woman will come into your life and help clean up your credit. A girlfriend, a girlfriend will help you find pieces to put some shit together like a puzzle, but a woman will help you find pieces of yourself to help put your relationship back together with God. A girlfriend will take off all of her clothes and ask you to do something like have sex with her or make love to her, but a woman will take off all of her insecurities, leave her pride on your pillows and ask you to have your way with her or make God reconsider his policy on things like racism and sexism and poverty because see, that is making love a girl a girlfriend will compliment your outfit. A woman will compliment your whole existence. You trip. You trip over girls. You untie your shoelaces, dig a hole in the concrete, blindfold yourself, run forward and fall stone for women. See, baby, girlfriends are for teenagers, Tracy Ellis Ross, and BET. You introduce girlfriends like, hey, mom, meet my new girlfriend. But women, us women are introduced like this is the reason I've been sleeping lately. This is the reason my heartbeat can make a set of drums sound like the violin. She's the career that made me realize all of my old girlfriends were just jobs and I had to work harder. If I wanted to retire blissfully, a woman, she makes you taller. She's something like a spine. A girlfriend ain't nothing more than a sling or a back brace and I need a lot more than a care package after an earthquake. See, nowadays, most of us are too willing to sign for packages a lot lighter than we ordered now. I'm not saying that you can't turn a girlfriend into a woman. I'm just saying that shit is like trying to turn Wendy Williams into Oprah, um, <laughs> a Fago into a Pepsi, <laughs> fucking PC into a Mac, and uh, <laughs> shameless plug. And um, I've been dressing myself <laughs> long enough to know what looks good on me. And I'm sorry, but a girlfriend is an outfit that my maturity has passed down to my little cousins years ago. Thank you, Flint. You have been awesome. Oh. Wait a second. Let me get this right. T. Miller, give it up. See, I'm cool. I'm on schedule. I'm cool. I'm cool. I got you. All right. So I got a few little things for you. Before we walk out of here and take our trash with us, please. <laughs> oh, that was my own plug. Saturday, March 24th, make sure you guys get to the Flint 500. Oh, I'm telling you, I've been there. I'm going again. I'll be there late, Tony, though. But I'll be there. I'll be there. Um, make sure you guys see them for the bracelets, right life. Hit it up. Next, Women About Women, appreciate you guys all for coming out, every single person that came. Everyone on the open mic list, Latasia, not sure if she's still here. Shelly, my homie. Danielle, ninth grade. Elizabeth Taylor and Cloud. Make sure you guys give it up for them. If you see them, talk to them. <laughs> April 20th, 6.30 p.m. Be at the Kiva, University of Michigan Flint. University Center, when you first walk in, first room on the right. You can't even get lost, I swear. Just don't park in the U, because public safety will give you a ticket. I'm just saying, I work for them too. 
Um, don't be mad. I mean, you know, I might be hosting or something. I might be busy, so somebody else will give a ticket. You know, I, I'm just warning you because I like you guys. Um, make sure you guys support all the artists. A lot of, uh, t I think T. Miller had like four or five things going, um, CDs, books, things. Make sure you guys purchase them. She said collectively $20. Only $20. Boom. See, oh, yeah. You learn, you learn. You learned. <laughs> April 5th, Thursday, the Art and Social Justice panel. Make sure you guys uh, check that out. Where, Dr. Curry, where is this at? Mm -hmm. The Kiva. The Kiva. I love it. And the Michigan Rooms. Sign the sheet out there with your email if you're interested in learning more about that event and others in the future. Uh, make sure you pick up the book, Like Gwendolyn. Awesome. You said $10. $10. Oh, $10. You heard some of the material. You like it, pick it up. Um, let's see, let's see. We're thanking the University of Michigan Flint Diversity Council for help and financially supporting and bringing the features here today. Please give it up for them. It's a big deal. Dr. Curry, what you got? And another announcement. If you just want more poetry tonight from 9 mm -hmm, to 12, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. at the Soggy Bottom. Soggy Bottom. Right. Future's performing tonight, 9 to 1. Please, yeah, at the Soggy Bottom. Because some... You guys might need some more poetry in your life. I think you do. And if you hear him, you'll want to hear him again. So check him out. Support the artist. And the last thing, um, we want to thank Good Means um, for supporting this series. I would like to see a standing ovation myself. <laughs> Ken, the Ken with one end, he helped us up for the last three years, allowed us to have this space. And we can still, that's OK. He knows what we're talking about. We can still utilize this space. For future events, if you have some things, you may want a small intimate space, please feel free to contact Ken and utilize this space for future things, like I will be for a book release or something, if you guys want to see me again, for sure. So, hey, Regina, Lori, just want to give you, yes, I just want to give you a shout out for supporting us all the time and not wanting me to say your name on the microphone. All right, thank you guys. Please collect your trash. See y'all at the University of Michigan Flint next time.